welcome everybody. Um, I'm Sarah Dickinson, and I'm very glad to uh, have you here for this last 19V seminar of the year. Um, I'd like to thank the Jordan Center at NYU, as usual, for uh, providing us a platform to have these meetings. This is the end of our third season. Um, thanks especially to uh, Anne Lounsbury and Margaret Shamu of the Org Committee of 19V for their help in setting up the seminar series, and to Sasha Spitalnik and tonight to, uh, to Lena uh, Sheets for administrative help running the the Zoom meeting and so on. Um, our seminar series is going to start in the fall. I'll just warn you in case you are really organized and put these kinds of things on your calendar way in advance. On September 20th, we have an art history talk, then a his historical talk a month later, and then a literary talk in November. We're dropping down to one meeting a month. Um, I think everyone's probably had enough Zoom to make one meeting enough sufficient. Um, and so that brings us to tonight's talk, at which point I am delighted to introduce to you uh, tonight's speaker who tonight, I say tonight because it's 6 p.m. here for, for me and for Rodolphe, Rodolphe Baudin uh, from the Sorbonne. And the title of his talk is Translation as Politics, the Political Use of 19th Century French Translations of Karamzin's Letters of a Russian Traveler. And his subisidnik tonight is today for most of you is Abby Holkamp from the University of Chicago. So with no further ado, Rodolf Pajalsta. Спасибо большое. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank all the uh, organizers of the uh, seminar for having me. I'm very excited to be here and uh, to give this presentation. So I have a uh, PowerPoint presentation. I'm going to share the screen. Yes, great. All right, let's get started. So um, the idea of uh, this talk um, arose as I was completing the introduction to my translation of Nikolai Karamzin's letters of a Russian traveler in October 2021. And um, here is the uh, the translation itself on the uh, on the right hand side of the screen. This translation is the first complete translation into French of Karamzin's famous late 18th century travelogue. The reason I am stressing the word complete is that some parts of Karamzin's text had been translated into French before, in the mid and late 19th century. These translations, however, focused only on the French part of Karamzin's travelogue, sometimes adding uh, isolated episodes from the German and Swiss ones. No full translation offering the whole four parts, that is the German, Swiss, French, and British ones, was therefore available to the French reading public until recently, which is the reason why I was offered by a Paris-based publisher to translate the whole work. While translating the Russian text, I decided to compare my translation with the already existing ones, especially as a way to seek help when I was struggling with a Russian word or expression. Comparing my translation to the previous ones proved productive and helped me solve translation problems more than once. But comparing my work with the work of my predecessors proved productive in yet another way. While initially turning to these translations for the stylistic help they could offer, I soon paid attention to the paratext of these previous editions, especially to the introductions to the translations, in order to see how my predecessors legitimized their decision to translate Karamzin's letters. What struck me upon reading these introductions was the deeply political dimension of the legitimizing discourse they were mobilizing. Of course, scholars working on translation since the cultural turn of translation studies and the rise of descriptive translation studies in the late 1980s and early 1990s have all emphasized the political dimension of any translation attempt. In the words of André Lefebvre, quote, translation has to do with authority and legitimacy and ultimately with power. Translation is not just a window opened on another world or some such pious platitude. 
Rather, translation is a channel open through which foreign influences can penetrate the native culture, challenge it, and even contribute to subverting it." End of quote. Additionally, as Gideon Turi has shown, a translation, a translation is not just a textual product, but what's labeled a translation event, that is, uh, quote, the social, historical, cultural, ideological context of situation in which the act of translation is embedded, end of quote. This attention to context incited descriptive translation studies to focus on the agents and institutions involved in translating events from the translators themselves to the institutions granting them with the authority and material conditions necessary to accomplish translating acts. The work of these agents and institutions and the relations they develop with translators form what André Lefebvre calls translation patronage, which always follows specific political and or economic agendas. The, uh, this attention to the political dimension of, of, uh, dimension of translation events seems particularly relevant in the Russian context. As Derek Offord and Vladislav Rzeudsky have shown, starting from the, the 18th century, quote, literature, and in particular the theater as a public form of art, were useful means of improving the image of Russia in Europe. However, the only way to demonstrate the excellence of Russian literature and theater to Enlightenment Europe was through translation, since uh, hardly anyone uh, spoke Russian at the time. Translation, therefore, had an important place in the cultural strategy of the Russian court, end of quote. Starting with efforts to circulate translations of, of, of Kantemir satires and Sumarokov's tragedies in French journals under Elizabeth Petrovna's reign, uh, the conduct of literary propaganda through translation into French was, quote, a long-term enterprise, end of quote. And this long-term enterprise did not end with the 18th century, but carried on well into the following one, as we will see. Together with translations, accounts on Russian literature published abroad were instrumental in offering a positive image of Russia to foreign audiences. Here again, as Carole Chapin has shown, efforts started in the mid 18th century with the publication of papers in French journals on the state of literature in Russia, which, quote, testify rather of the existence of a Franco-Russian network than of a sudden interest in Russian literature among French-speaking journalists, end of quote. Among the agents of this active network, Russian grandees like André Chouvalov, French diplomats stationed in Russia like the Chevalier Déon, and Paris-based French journalists like Elie Fréron collaborated to produce papers pursuing, as Alexander Stroyev put it, quote, literary and political goals meant at asserting the reputation of the Russian empress and strengthening political ties between the two countries, end of quote. Here again, far from disappearing with the 18th century, such efforts continued well into the 19th century, peaking in the 1880s at a time when literary patronage had disappeared with the publication of Melchior de Vogue's 1886 book, the Russian novel. Okay, so I'd like to, there you go. A St. Petersburg-based French diplomat, Vogue played a major role in popularizing Russian literature in France. The publication of his famous essay contributed to a booming of translations of Russian novels into French. As Pauline Gacoin Blanchy has noted, translations of Russian novels grew from 16 in 1886 the year Vogue's essay was published, to 25 in 1888. And here again, this combined effort of publicizing and translating Russian literature into French was at least partly politically motivated. A firm supporter of a political alliance between France and Russia against Germany, Vogue wrote in his introduction to the Russian novel, quote, for which I will not elaborate here since everybody understands them as it is, 
I believe it is important to work on getting both countries closer by means of a mutual penetration of matters of the mind. As between two men, there can be no close friendship nor solidarity between two cultures before their minds have come to contact." End of quote. It seems then that commenting on Russian literature for the French public and translating Russian literature into French were often politically motivated in the 18th and 19th centuries, long before they became an element of Cold War politics, with the French Communist Party developing a policy of translating Soviet classics on the one hand, and anti-Soviet publishing houses translating Pasternak and Solzhenitsyn's work on the other. With that in mind, I would like to use today's talk to study the political aspects of all 19th century French translations of Karamzin's letters of a Russian traveler. Such a study has never been attempted before, if only because Karamzin's sentimental travelogue seemed less politically oriented than his history of the Russian state, a text which was immediately perceived as a manifesto of Russian political conservatism, both in Russia and abroad, and fought as such by both Russian and Western liberals. When he published his picturesque, dramatic, and parodic history of Holy Russia, during the Crimean War in 1854, French painter and printmaker Gustave Doré used Karamzin not only as a source of information on Russian history, but also as a political text to argue with. By comparison, letters of a Russian traveler, which were regarded mainly as an imitation of Laurence Stern's sentimental journey through France and Italy, may have seemed a, political a politically neutral text. As a result, its translations were never studied as political objects. Moving the focus from translations as textual products to translation acts as the work of translation patronage structures will help us shed light on the political significance of these translations. I will comment on these translations in chronological order and start by, introdu by introducing into the picture an early translation unknown to historians of Russian literature and specialists on the history of cultural relations between France and Russia. Since this study focuses on translation, it offers a few reflections in the field of textual traductology, especially when the stylistic or hypertextual strategies chosen by the translators directly depended on the political contexts of their translation acts. I do not, however, study their publishing strategies or the reception of their translations by their French contemporary audiences. Which brings me to my first part. Translating Karamzin's letters at the, nope, that's not it. There you go. Translating Karamzin's letters at the downfall of the first French empire. As Tatiana Bulkova has shown, during Karamzin's lifetime, his letters of a Russian traveler were fully translated into German and English. If they did not enjoy a similar success in France, it is erroneous to think that they were entirely ignored there before the death of their author in 1826. They were indeed translated, albeit partially, and in some fortuitous way quite early in the century. In fact, the first French translation of letters of a Russian traveler is not, as the traditional narrative has it, the one published in 1867 by Viktor Stepanovich Paroshin, which I will discuss in my second part. It was the translation of Joseph Golvin Tuo de la Bouvrie, whose uh, portrait you can see on the screen, a moderate politician, deputy of the third estate for the seneschalty of Ploermel in the Estates General of 1789, then a deputy of Morbihan, that's a department in Brittany, under the First Empire and the Bourbon Restoration. In 1815, uh, the Breton politician and writer published a 75 page long booklet in the octave format in the press of Gal Inné, King's Printer in Vannes, that's a small town in Brittany again, entitled Extracts from the Trips of Mr. Karamzin, Doctor in Moscow. 
In his introduction, written on October the 21st, 1813 in Ploermel, that's a village in Brittany, where he fulfilled the functions of, the functions of deputy justice of the peace and county head, Thieu de la Bouvrie wrote the following, quote, Mr. Nikolai Karamzin, a doctor from Moscow and a very rich man, made a trip to Courland, Poland, Prussia, Switzerland, France, and England. He gave the account of it in a work in three volumes, translated into English by an unknown person. I do not understand German, but passably English. The content, the style, the details, the descriptions offered by this interesting journey where I found new truths for me, as well as a mix of French, English, and even slightly Oriental elements, all presented in a poetic way, pleased me so much that I could not resist the temptation to translate the last part relating to London and the domestic life of the rural inhabitants of this famous island. I wrote it in haste, but as best as I could, according to my custom, without wasting precious time, especially at my age, in correcting the mistakes with which everything that comes out of my pen abounds. I will be satisfied if the reader can guess the talent of the original author and find a moment of amusement, recreation, or distraction. The beginning of the book offers as much interest to foreigners, uh, for foreigners to friends as for those curious in history and science, but they did not please me to the point of giving me the hope of pleasing the audience by translating them. Two episodes provided me with the material for two little tales in verse, or rather with rhymes. I play locations of the scene in Germany for one and in Switzerland for the other in the original book in the province of Brittany, where I was born, where I lived, where I hoped to die, and which was always so dear to my heart. I will try to copy them one after the other if my health allows me, and I ask for the whole thing a lot of indulgence. I feel how much I need it, and I do not conceal the distance between Mr. Karamzin and myself." End of quote. As this introduction suggests, the first French translation of Karamzin's letters was therefore an indirect translation made on the basis of the English edition of 1803, translated by a man called Feldborg. It was also partial since it only concerned the letters on England. Additionally, even these English letters were translated partially as Thieu de la Bouvrie faithfully followed Feldborg, who had removed from his translation two of Karamzin's original letters, number 153 and 154 in Lotman and Uspensky's edition. Similarly, Thieu de la Bouvrie's faithfulness to Feldborg's translation resulted in the removal of entire paragraphs from the end of Karamzin's original letters, number 1 and 36, 1 and 51, and 1 and 55. Finally, Thieu de la Bouvrie, just like Feldborg, merged some of Karamzin's letters. But if Feldborg had merged only two letters, number 144 and 146, Thieu de la Bouvrie merged six, the same two as Feldberg, but also letters 136 with 137 and 142 with 143. In this respect, Thieu de la Bouvrie showed more paratextual creativity than Karamzin's English translator. This creativity also materialized on a hypertextual level. As he put it in his introduction, the Breton writer added to his translations two rewritings in verse of two prose episodes from Karamzin's original text. The first one is the story about Jean and Lisette, told in letter 87 in Lotman and Uspensky's edition, while Karamzin's narrator travels across the Pays Jex in France on March the 4th, 1790. The other one is the tale about Count Gleichen, told by the Russian traveler in letter 36 in Lotman and Uspensky's edition, written from Erfurt in Germany on July 22nd, 1789. These two rewritings offered by Thieu de la Bouvrie in an appendix to his translation are interesting in several ways. First, they testify of Thieu de la Bouvrie's specific mechanisms of hypertextual appropriation. The French translator relocated the action of Karamzin's tales 
to his home region of Brittany. The first tale, retitled Lise and Hylas, in Thieu de la Bouvry's translation, takes place in the Baie des Trépassés, that is the Bay of the Dead, in Western Brittany, from which it borrows its subtitle, The Cape of the Dead. The second tale, retitled A True Story, substitutes Count Gleichen with Count du Chastel, a famous Breton medieval vassal. This Frenchification of the Bouvry's Russian hypotext is remarkable, as it is an early example of reverse dynamics in the circulation mechanisms of literary borrowing from center to periphery in 18th century European literature, an interesting case of French sklanienie or perelagenie na naše nrave, to quote the borrowing model advocated by Vladimir Lukin in 18th century Russia. But these two rewritings provide yet additional information. First, they demonstrate that Theodore Labouvry's interest in letters of a Russian traveler was broader than the mere interest in Britain, which he mentions to justify his translation. Secondly, the testify of the translator's taste for the aesthetic regime used by Karamzin in both tales. As Theodore Labouvry explains concerning the first appendix, quote, I borrowed from this short episode the subject of the following idyll or elegy, but making it really interesting would require the talent of Theocritus." End of quote. What this quote reveals is Thieu de la Bouvry's admiration for Karamzin's ability to imitate in prose the idyllic or elegiac register of ancient poetry, which he himself feels able to render only in verse. In a sense, he granted Karamzin with the talent of Gessner, who had set the model for adapting to modern prose the sensibility of these two genres of ancient poetry. The specific talent of Gessner and Karamzin resulted in their elegant simplicity, a distinctive feature of Karamzin's prose, according to another French translator of his, Henri de Coiffier, who translated Karamzin's short stories, Natalia, the Boyer's daughter, for Lisa and Julie in 1808. In his introduction, Coiffier, Coiffier sorry, wrote the following, quote, and that's taken from uh, this collection of uh, short stories translated from um, Russian and uh, Danish called Roman du Nord, um, Northern Novels. So what does Coiffier say about uh, Karamzin's style? Quote, the way they are written is not the least of their merits, and those who have had the chance to read them in the original have saluted the successful mix of elegance and simplicity, of naivety and elevation which reigns in Karamzin's style." End of quote. Karamzin's simplicity was obviously seen by Kwafi as a distinctively Russian feature, in accordance with the symbolic hierarchies elaborated by French cultural imperialism, which identified a center, France, and a periphery, Europe's margins, America, whose youth guaranteed its preserved innocence. As Coiffier put it in his introduction, quote, I will say, I will only say that Karim's insensibility seems to me, so to speak, newer than ours and closer to nature. End of quote. Thieu de la Bouvry expressed a similar idea when he wrote, quote, the content, the style, the details, the descriptions offered by this interesting journey where I found new truths for me, as well as a mix of French, English, and even slightly Oriental elements, all presented in a poetic way, pleased me so much that I could not resist the temptation to translate the last part." End of quote. In this sentence, the reference to the supposedly Oriental elements of Karamzin's prose was used to explain its appeal. Karamzin's sensibility was neither totally French nor totally English. It was newer because it was more natural and simpler thanks to its peripheral character. Despite its accuracy, apart from the translation of, few, of a few names, Bomelli instead of Romelli in letter 135, 
bronc instead of banks in letter one and 40, sonly instead of townly, in fact, tolly in letter 141. Two de la Bouvry's translation remained unnoticed and does not appear in the catalogues of France's main libraries. I was lucky enough to find it by mere chance uh, on eBay. Uh, we only know, thanks to two of the Bouvry's comments in the introduction to his own trans translation, that he presented his two rewritings in verse to the Paris Philotechnical Society and the Paris Athenaeum of the Arts, two learned societies of which he was a member. The sessions of these uh, two learned societies uh, during which Théodore Bouvry presented his rewritings obviously took place somewhere between the end of 1813 and 1815, since they must have taken place during or after the completion of Théodore Bouvry's translation, which he dated October the 21st, 1813, and the publication of the book in Van in 1815. This chronology of events reveals another possible reason for Théodore Bouvry's interest in translating letters of a Russian traveler into French, and that's the reason which brings us to uh, the main focus of my talk, a political reason. By translating from English a Russian text offering a positive picture of British society, Thieu de la Bouvry expressed unambiguous political sympathies at a time when the Bourbons were recovering their throne in France, thanks to the combined efforts of England and Russia. Additionally, by dating his translation back to 1813 in his introduction, the French translator emphasized that these sympathies were not new, they did not start in 1815, when the first French empire collapsed, they started two years earlier. And as such, that they were politically bold since French literary texts and the press had been dominated by a violently anglophobic discourse during the last years of the first French empire. Tipo Sai, a tragedy by the French playwright Etienne de Jouy, whose plot is located in India, was staged before the emperor that very same year, that is in 1813. It abounded in anti-British verses like the following ones. Quote, an, inv an invincible terror seizes my heart when I hear the name English. My bosom is full of inextinguishable hatred for this treacherous, miser, and cruel nation. These bandits from Albion deserve the hatred which I attach to their name. End of quote. Thieu de la Bouvry's political agenda became even clearer at the end of his booklet. Right after the end of his translation, the translator introduced a, para a paratextual mention which contained an unambiguous hint at ongoing events, including the recent French defeat during the Battle of Leipzig. Quote, Translated in Plohermel from the beginning of October 1813 to this day, October the 21st, people are dancing in our small town on the occasion of the wedding of the sous prefet's son. People would probably not dare dancing in Paris. End of quote. By emphasizing the happiness associated with the Breton wedding and opposing it to the sadness supposedly reigning in Paris, as the first French empire was collapsing, Thieu de la Bouvry introduced a metaphorical opposition between beginnings and ends and clearly suggested where his sympathies went. Additionally, his translation was offering a glimpse at what new beginnings could look like for France. Britain, in Karamzin's depiction, was a stable country where constitutional monarchy and parliamentarism were keys to a flourishing economy. This model was obviously Thieu de la Bouvry's favorite political option. A politically moderate deputy, he would survive three consecutive regimes, the revolution, the, Fen the French First Empires, and the Bourbons' rest restoration, to which he was offering the model provided by Britain and um, presented in his translation uh, as a political option. 
So let's move on to uh, the second part, to uh, our second translator and to the second political context which gave birth to this translation. Translating Karimzin's letters after the January insurrection. So if the first uh, French translation of Karimzin's letters of a Russian traveler was published in the aftermath of the Franco-Anglo-Russian Napoleonic Wars, its second translation, the one I'm going to discuss now, appeared in the aftermath of another political crisis, which opposed, if not France and Russia as states, uh, at least the French public and the politics of the Russian government during the times of Napoleon III. This second French translation was published under the title Letters of a Russian Traveler in France, Germany, oops, there we go. In France, um, Germany and Switzerland, 1789-1790. It came out in 1867 at a time when the French public was still trying to recover from the indignation with which it was filled by the brutal crushing by the Russian army of the Polish insurrection of 1861-1863. The translator, Viktor Stepanovich Paroshin, here is again on the, the slide on the right-hand side, that's Viktor Stepanovich for you. So the translator was trained as an economist in Dorpat and in Germany before becoming a professor of political economy and statistics at the University of St. Petersburg. In 1847, he had left his position at the university and moved to Paris in order to dedicate himself to writing on Russian affairs for the French reading public. His publications included numerous papers for the journal The North, Le Nord, as well as various brochures, such as The Social Regeneration of Russia, Regeneration Sociale de la Russie, 1860, A Practical Solution to the Peasant Question in Russia, Solution Pratique de la Question des Paysans en Russie, 1864, or Russia's Material Resources, Les Ressources Materielles de la Russie, 1864 again. Obviously, the greater part of Paroshin's publications commented on the great reforms of Alexander II, notably the greatest of them all, the abolition of serfdom. Other publications by Paroshin, however, focused on more politically sensitive topics, like his 1862 brochure, a contested nationality, Russia and Poland, une nationalité contestée, Russie et Pologne. According to French historian Charles Corbin, Paroshin's departure from Russia did not mean that he stopped working for the Russian state. His activity as a journalist was just another way to serve it, and he was probably on the Russian payroll. A loyal and conscientious Russian civil servant as uh, Corbin labels him, Paroshin must have been affected by the wave of anti-Russian sentiments which hit France when Russia crushed the Polish upheaval in 1863. And that's uh, a very first photography from 1863, which uh, uh, illustrates uh, quite well the dominating um, hostility towards Russia um, within the French political opinion uh, in 1863. It is only natural, given his situation, that Paroshin joined the efforts of agents of the Russian counter-propaganda in Paris to fight it. Indeed, far from disappearing with the end of the Russian repression in Poland in 1863, anti-Russian publications continued to flourish in France until the middle of the 1860s. In 1865, for instance, Schedo Ferrari published What Shall We Do With Poland? Que fera-t-on de la Pologne? And in 1866, Henri Martin published Russia and Europe, La Russie et l'Europe, a pamphlet in which he asserted Russia was neither European nor even really Slavic and called European countries to unite against it. In the face of such criticism, 
it seemed difficult to find a better response than to give the French public access to Karim's in letters of a Russian traveler. A text whose hero embodied the ideal figure of the Europeanized Russian gentleman, perfectly integrated into the space and culture from which Henri Martin wished to exclude his country. And here I have added uh, a slide with two illustrations from the uh, German um, translation of Kanzin's letters of a Russian traveler. And both these illustrations show the traveler as a perfect European gentleman uh, being gallant with a lady on the right, on the left hand side, that's taken from an, an episode from the German part, uh, being uh, benevolent and protective with a young Swiss couple, um, as a Western gentleman would do uh, while attending a uh, wedding in the Swiss Alps. So, just, you know, the perfect Europeanized gentleman. So officially, the uh, decision to use Karamzin's text to restore Russia's reputation by presenting it as a refined and xenophile country in order to find the image of Russia's savagery publicized by Poland supporters relied on Karamzin's 100th birthday, an event largely celebrated in Russia. Karamzin was born in 1766, therefore um, the... 100th birthday, um, his 100th birthday uh, anniversary was celebrated in 1866, and that's the year when Paroshin started publish uh, when, when he started translating Letters of a Russian Traveler, and by the time he uh, finished translating it and published the translation, uh, it came out in 1867. If, as Paroshin suggested, introduction, introducing French readers with Russia's best son would undoubtedly win in many French hearts. It seems reasonable to assume that Karamzin's translator hoped that this sympathy would extend to Karamzin's country as well. As Paroshin wrote in his introduction, quote, Karamzin served the cause of literature. He worked for the propagation of knowledge and the softening of Morris. Emolit Mores nec sinit esse feros. Russia today celebrates the 100th anniversary of his birth. May this little book, published for the first time in a language that could be said to be universal, making many friends abroad and inspiring them something of the high and sincere esteem that we profess for his memory. End of quote. Though elegantly translated in a style still relatively close to that of the 18th century, Karamzin's letters in Paroshin's version were also incomplete. As its title suggested, this new translation excluded the English episode of the original text, therefore reducing it to German, Swiss, and French parts. Additionally, the title of the translation evoked these parts in an illogical order, first France, then Germany and Switzerland, in order to appeal to its target audience by flattering their personal cultural hierarchies. Besides, the removal of the English part uh, from the Russian text was not the only reduction imposed on the original text by its second French translator. Even within the three preserved parts, Paroshin made a selection among the German and Swiss letters and pruned even some of the French ones when he did not simply remove them. If the text of the translation logically resorted to the geography mistreated in the, titled, in the title, it offered only seven of the 40 letters of the German part of the Russian text, starting it with a depiction of Weimar, which corresponds to letter 33 in Karamzin's original travelogue. The second part of the text, which corresponds more or less to the journey through Switzerland, offered only 32 of the original 43 letters. As for the fourth part, which describes the end of the French episode and the English episode, it offered only 16 letters out of the 51 of the original text, mainly as a result of the removal of the part on England. As a consequence, only the third part of Karamzin's original text, which corresponds to the bulk of the French episode, was fully offered by Paroshin's translation. Besides, this does not mean that Paroshin did not prune some of the French letters. Uh, 
For instance, he removed some of Karamzin sentimental metadiegetic embedded narratives, as well as some as well as some of the Russian traveler's digressions. Additionally, he partly reorganized the original text as Tudor Bouvry had before him, splitting some of the longest letters into two when he obviously considered them too long, or moving some letters from one place to another inside the translated text. This very creative attitude towards the Russian original text was obviously considered too unrestrained by Karamzin's third and last French translator in the 19th century, the historian Arsène Lagrel, uh, whose translation I discuss in my third and last part. Translating Karamzin against Germany. So here is Arsène Lagrel for you uh, on the right-hand side of the screen. As Lagrel explained in the introduction to his 1885 translation of Karamzin's Letters of a Russian Traveler, quote, why did Parosian remove almost half of the letters? And especially why did he decide to prune, squeeze, in other words, distort the text he had in front of him? As a result of this systematic reduction effort, instead of a deeply personal way of seeing and expressing things, all that remained was a deeply unpersonal text, an insipid text written in the style of people who don't know how to write. End of quote. So as you understand, uh, being more faithful was uh, Le Grel's uh, main argument uh, when presenting his new translation of letters of a Russian traveler. So who was uh, Le Grel? He was the son of a notary from Normandy. He studied at the Royal High School of Versailles, then at the Law School of Rouen University in Normandy, and at the School of Arts and Science of Douai University. After graduation, he embarked on a career as a journalist and a historian while developing a strong interest in foreign languages and literatures. As a journalist, he was a frequent contributor to the Review of Public Instruction, Revue d'Instruction Publique, the Contemporary Review, Revue Contemporaine, and the European Review, Revue Européenne. He was also an active traveler and visited Germany several times. One of his travels to Germany took him to Weimar, where he enrolled in graduate school to write a PhD dissertation on Goethe. He completed his PhD in 1863 and defended it at the University of Jena. His initial interest in Germany soon led him to develop an interest in Denmark, whose language he started studying in order to write a second PhD thesis on Molière and Holberg which he defended at the University uh, of Paris in 1864. After considering an academic career, Le Grel dropped the idea and resumed traveling, visiting first Italy and Spain before developing an interest in Russia, where he traveled for the first time in 1869. His first trip to Russia incited him to study Russian after his return to France, and he found an instructor among the Russian émigré living in Vevey, Switzerland, who taught him the language from 1869 to 1872. He would visit Russia again in 1872, 1875, 1881, and 1884. After his third trip, Le Grel published an account of a journey through the European part of the Russian Empire. The book came out in 1877 under the title The Volga River, Le Volga. This first book was uh, on Russia, sorry, was soon followed by several translations, which Le Grel published between 1882 and 1888. They include Tsar Boris, Le Tsar Boris by Alexei Tolstoy, Wolf from Wit, Le Malheur d'avoir de l'esprit by Alexander Gribayadov. The Storm, L'Orage by Alexander Ostrovsky, The Chicane, La Chicane by Vasily Kapnist, and O Times, O Temps by Empress Catherine II. As this list suggests, Le Grel seems to have shared a special interest in drama, a literary genre he eventually tried himself at in later years. What strikes the most at the sight of this list, however, is the eclectic character of Le Grel's literary interests. As a translator, 
His choice of text to translate included both important and often recent work, such as Griboyedov, Ostrovsky, and Tolstoy's plays, and more modest texts of historical rather than literary significance. Additionally, uh, what this uh, list suggests is that he seems to have been especially interested in 18th century Russian literature, which explains his decision to translate Karamzin. If initially fed by intellectual curiosity, possibly in relation with his interest in Holberg, who served as a model for Russia's criticism of Gallomedia in the 18th uh, century, Lughel's interest in Russia soon became political. Indeed, four out of his five trips to Russia happened after the Franco-Prussian War of 1870, which deeply troubled the Germany lover Le Grel had been for years. As his biographer Croiset put it, Le Grel's sympathy for the hardworking and peaceful Saxony soon gave way to a deep hatred for Prussia, which he saw as essentially brutal and oppressive and which resonated with the anti-German feelings of the French population. And uh, this is yet again, a very famous lithograph from the 1880s, uh, which illustrates um, the deep hatred experienced by the French public opinion for Bismarck and Prussia after the Franco-Prussian War. This radical evolu evolution, that is the radical evolution of Le Grel, which anticipated the dramatic shift in the European geopolitical alliances that followed the death of Bismarck, is obvious in Le Grel's negative judgments about Prussia in his introduction to his translation. So as his translation concerns only the French part of the text, he uses his introduction to summarize the content of the other parts, uh, including the content of the German episode. And so in this introduction, that's what he says about, about Germany, quote, about Prussia. Quote, Karamzin arrived in Berlin on June the 29th and left in haste on July the 9th, eight days earlier than expected. The truth is that he felt overwhelmed and deeply frustrated by an unbearable sense of boredom. True, Berlin was then celebrating and Karamzin got a chance to see the royal family at a gala show, but the absence of sewers and hygienic measures filled the city with smells so bad you needed to pinch your nose. Additionally, he had to deal with the countless humiliating formalities imposed on travelers by inquisition-like police. Grandes, regardless of their wealth, distinguished themselves only by their squalid stinginess. As for men of letters, they spend their time in literary feuds that reminded the quarrels of lackeys." End of quote. Another passage from the introduction shows Le Grel gloating at Karamzin's hint at Russia's victory over Prussia and taking of Berlin during the Seven Years' War in October 1760. Quote, Karamzin could not refrain from experiencing a patriotic satisfaction as he passed by the statue of Frederick Wilhelm, known as the Great, whose pedestal, if not more, had been damaged by the swords of his compatriots. End of quote. Finally, while summarizing the stay of Karamzin's traveler in Dresden, Le Grel hints at a recent event which shocked the French and European public uh, opinion and was widely used by French propaganda to demonstrate Prussian brutality. The bombing of Strasbourg's cathedral during the Franco-Prussian War of 1860. Uh, that's the quote. First, in the Catholic Church of Dresden, Karamzin, moved by the striking and heavenly notes of the organ, kneeled down. The Russian shells of 1760, whose traces were still visible in various places of the city. Oh, sorry, not the Russian, my mistake, the Prussian, of course. The Prussian shells of 1760, whose traces were still visible in various places of the city, had fortunately not hit these wonders. End of quote. And I'm pretty confident that uh, the French reading audience would have... Um, 
read that as a hint to the uh, uh, catastrophic and traumatizing bombing of Strasbourg and of Strasbourg Cathedral during the Strasbourg siege of 1870, especially since, as I said, it was a very heavily publicized example of the supposedly barbaric um, um, mores of uh, the Prussians in anti-Prussian French propaganda. Lacan's outrageous way to use Karamzin's quotations to express his own anti-Prussian feelings was, however, not the only expression of his chauvinism. The translator also used the Russian text to express an essentialized form of anglophobia, a common feeling in France in the 1880s, as French and English imperialist interests increasingly conflicted in Africa. Quote, Karamzin's usual benevolence could not win over this selfishness, either brutal or hypocritical, which serves as the basic rule for every British action and which makes our neighbors from over the channel the purest type, like the proof before the print of the Anglo-Saxon race, end of quote. And I used uh, as an illustration, a uh, popular um, uh, caricature from the 1890s, which illustrates the uh, um, struggle um, between France and Britain over uh, domination in Egypt. Um, so considering Lecrel's prejudices against Germany and Britain, they could have alone justified his decision to translate and publish only the French part of Karam's in letters of a Russian traveler. However, this decision originated in yet another argument. It was the result of Legrel's vision of Karmsin's travelogue mainly as a document on the history of the French Revolution. This understanding of the text explains why Legrel's translation was initially published in the scholarly journal, The Revolution Review, La Revue de la Révolution, before being published as a separate volume. This conception, uh, this conception of Karamzin's text as a document explains two of the three arguments brought up by Le Grel to justify his decision to make the Russian travelogue available to the French public. By translating letters of a Russian traveler, Le Grel wished to offer them, quote, a picture of Paris in 1790 and, quote, a cold blood, common sense based evaluation of the revolution. And as you understand, um, uh, he translated the, uh, the text by 1885 and everybody was getting ready for the uh, upcoming celebration of the 100th anniversary of 1789. Uh, the last third reason was characteristic of the dominating political discourse in France after the 1870 defeat against Prussia. According to Le Grel, Karamzin's good spirit and sincerity, that's a quote, could play a role in the moral regeneration many in the country were now demanding. Le Grel considered that the Russian 18th century writer uh, could indeed serve as, quote, an excellent antidote against this harmful affliction of contemporary minds whose characteristics included a moral imperative of outrageous frivolity, the habit of making fun of every serious matter and every religion, as well as the habit of juggling with ideas while making fun of, what my, while making fun of oneself and other people, and of treating the most serious questions in the language of Mascari and Quint. End of the quote. As this quote suggests, Karamzin's appeal to Le Grel lied heavily in the Russian writer's moderate conservatism, as well as in his rejection of radical enlightenment ideas. As such, Karamzin offered, according to Le Grel, a model for 1880s French politics, but also for 1880s French literature, which Le Grel had violently criticized in a previous series of articles where he expressed his hostility to contemporary naturalism. In this sense, Le Grel echoed Vogue, whose Roman Russe 
as Gacoin Le Blanchy reminds us, suggested to replace Zola type naturalism with Russian Christian based realism. Le Grel only came up with a different substitution product based on a nostalgia for 18th century elegance, which prefigured its use as a response to Russian realist paintings by artists of the Mir Iskustva collective, such as Alexander Benoit. So uh, let me just say a few words um, as a conclusion. As this talk demonstrated, all three translations of Letters of a Russian Traveler published in 19th century France were the products not only of their author's curiosity for 18th century Russian literature, but first and foremost of contemporary local political circumstances, which they wish to comment on or influence. For Thieu de la Bouvrie, translating Karamzin was a declaration of Anglophilia and a political statement in favor of a liberal Bourbon restoration based on the English political model. For Paroshin, translating Karamzin was an attempt, probably sponsored by the Russian government, to present the French public with a portrait of an, of an enlightened, xenophile, and fully European Russian nobleman, in order to find the dominating narrative about Russian political and military brutality exemplified by the repression of the recent Polish upheaval. For Le Grel, finally, translating Karamzin was a way to fight contemporary French naturalism and cynicism and replace them with a cultural and moral model important from Russia in order to fuel French Russophilia, a vital political task as the country was looking for allies against Germany. In other words, Kamzin's Letters of a Russian Traveler proved useful at three defining points in the history of Franco-Russian relations in the 19th century, serving as a positive political, cultural, and literary model meant to bring closer the two countries in order to serve the specific political agendas of their three translators and or the translation patrons behind them. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Rodolphe. That was fascinating. And let's hear what Abby has to say about it. Uh, yes. Hi, everyone. Um, I also want to thank Rodolphe for this really fascinating presentation um, on these 19th century French translations of Nikolai Karamzin's Letters of a Russian Traveler. Um, he uh, really did a comprehensive job of placing each of the three translations he discussed in this sort of larger tradition. Um, of 18th and 19th century translations and studies um, of Russian literature in France, such as um, he mentioned, uh, Melchior de, de Vogue's landmark 1886 study, uh, The Russian Novel, um, and these translations that offer generally a positive image of Russia to French audiences. Um, reflecting on his own experience as a translator of Karmzine into French, he reminds us, and rightly so, that translation is always a political project. Um, so let me just offer a quick reminder of the political context or the possible political goals of each of the three translations that Rodolphe um, just analyzed for us. So we have our first translation, our sort of hidden, hidden translation that's not in any libraries from 1815, uh, partial translation by uh, Tuo de la Bouverie, um, which can be read uh, as a political statement in favor of a sort of English constitutional monarchy model um, for post-Napoleonic France. Um, and this is an indirect translation um, from an English edition. And then we have our 1867 translation uh, by former professor turned Russian expat uh, writer, Viktor Stepanovich uh, Poroshin which can be read as an attempt to rehabilitate Russia's image after its harsh suppression of the January uprising in Poland um, by showing us an enlightened Europeanized Russian nobleman um, fitting right in in Western Europe um, and putting possibly on the payroll of the Russian government itself. And then finally, we have our 1885 translation by the historian uh, Arsène Legrel, which can be read as an attempt 
to promote Russia as a political ally for France against Germany um, in this decade after the Franco-Prussian War and German unification under Bismarck. Um, and actually a partial question based on that, we know that, right, the Franco-Russian Franco alliance does come to be in the, in the 1890s. So I wonder, um, do we think this was a successful attempt? Um, so I think the paper also raises some really interesting and important questions about um, translation more broadly and translation from Russian into French, whether direct or indirect specifically. Um, so I'll use the rest of my time here just to pose a few sort of clusters of questions in this vein and you can address or not address whatever <laughs> speaks to you or not. Or they'll... Um, so you talked a bit about your own process as a translator and how you engaged first with these texts as a translator working on a translation. So I'd really love to hear more about that. Um, I was curious on sort of a more um, granular level, whether you felt like the political agenda or political goals came through in the texts themselves, or if it's something that's mostly present in the, the paratext of the translator's comments or the omissions that they make. Um, you know, did you ever notice anything political or anything that you felt was overtly political reflected on like the level of word choice or things like that? I was curious about. Um, on kind of a related note to that, I would be curious to hear more about how these translations speak to one another. You mentioned uh, Legras' critique of what he perceived as the inadequacies or maybe the creative liberties of Poroshin's translation. Um, do you think there's a political aspect to this critique or is it more of, a, of an artistic or a literary critique? Um, and did you notice any other engagement or intertextualities um, among the translations or translators themselves? Um, another thing, you noted that by the time of uh, Tuval de la Bouvier's translation, there were already complete English and German translations of the letters, but not French, right? And obviously, uh, Tuval de la Bouvier based his translation on the, on the English one. Um, so as someone who also works on the cultural relationship between France and Russia, I couldn't help but wonder whether you think there's anything going on here um, with the political nature of these translations that's specific to the relationship between Russia and France. Um, you know, especially when we also consider as you discussed the Russian relationship to the French Enlightenment in the 18th century. I was especially fascinated by this sort of example of uh, what you called French sclenenia that's present in the in the Tuile de la Bouvrie's translation. Um, so and also his characterization of, of Karamzin as somebody who has a sensibility that's not totally French or English, it's, it's natural, it's simpler. Um, so I'd love to hear more about what, if anything you think might be unique to the case of Russian into French translation in the 19th century, um, or whether you, know, you see this as a case that's more sort of generalizable what, talking about translation as politics. And so, my final thought, I know you specified that for this paper, you weren't considering publish, uh, publishing strategies or reception, but I can't help myself anyway. I would love to know if you have any thoughts on whether you think the question of political agenda changes if we take into account reception um, or possibly also patronage, um, right? So to, to put it another way, there were a couple of mentions, you, you quoted other, um, scholars talking about literary propaganda. Do you think these any of these translations were effective as such? Um, I was also wondering about this in the context of Karamzin's letters being very much of a hybrid genre, neither, you know, totally fictional nor totally non-fictional, you know, very characteristic of the 18th century, but doesn't necessarily slot neatly um, into a genre. It, it made me kind of wonder what relationship this kind of hybridity might play in reception or in effectiveness as literary propaganda, right? There's maybe more room to, to play around with it or to interpret it in different ways. Um, so I will stop there. I know that's a lot of questions, but I found this paper really fascinating and um, I'm looking forward to the rest of the discussion and other people's questions. Thank you. Wow, Abby, those were great questions. Thank you. Uh, Rodolfo, would you like to respond to some of those? Sure. Um, I'll, I'll try. I'll 
Um, I'll try to do my best. Uh, yeah, I know there were a lot. <laughs> Well, uh, thank you, Abby, uh, you know, first and foremost for uh, your um, um, very close reading of my text and, uh, and uh, your numerous questions. Uh, so you had a question about my, my process as a translator. Um, well, I, I could elaborate on, you know, how I translated that text and how I tried to... Um, um, imitate 18th century French in order to uh, make it sound uh, as if, you know, it had been written in the 18th century. What I found out while I was working on the translation is that uh, Karamzin's language is very simple, uh, which actually explains why it's accessible to our students, why it's very accessible to uh, French speakers, because it's very close, as we all know, to um, you know French syntaxes. But the thing is that it's also very simple from the point of view of um, you know the um, the lexicon. So um, and it's uh, I tried at at, at some point to uh, translate it as a very elaborated. Uh, you know, sort of 18th century uh, French language literary text, you know, like like Rousseau style, for instance, because Rousseau style uh, is really beautiful. And uh, it doesn't really work, actually, because uh, uh, Karamzin's language is so much simpler. Uh, there were times when, when you start translating texts from the 18th century, you realize that uh, they don't have that many words at their disposal, for instance, in, in dialogues. It's always skazal, skazala, ili gavaril, ili gavarila. Uh, it's it's only later that Russian literature will move on to more elaborated um, uh, forms, uh, you know, for the sake of diversity, like vzrajal, vzrajil, or things like that. You don't have that. So the 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 question for me was, uh, you know, do I use you know just the 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 uh, the most uh, uh, primitive equivalent, uh, which is dear, you know, for a Gavariti and Skazat, uh, each and every time, or do I allow myself to make it more readable to to uh, um, enhance the, my, my reader's reading experience? Do I allow myself to use synonyms? Especially since uh, uh, in France, we uh, when people work, who, who do uh, uh, literary translations from Russian and um, the people uh, who actually taught me translation in college uh, tend to say that uh, Russian um, um, is more comfortable with repetitions, with lexical repetitions, whereas French is not. Uh, you cannot use twice the same verb in one sentence, for instance. You have to use synonyms. So that's, you know, just to give you uh, a glimpse uh, um, you know, uh, at, my, at my work when I was uh, working as a translator. The fun part was to uh, use an, uh, a dictionary from the late 18th century, the, the, the dictionary of the, uh, of the Paris, uh, you know, the French Academy from 1799, and uh, to discover that a lot of words that sound uh, archaic to a contemporary French here uh, actually are not that old. Uh, did not exist in the uh, uh, in 1799, for instance, and a lot of words uh, which we use uh, as archaisms because that's beautiful and posh and whatever uh, actually mean extremely specific things, and you cannot use them. Uh, you know, uh, the, you have to, to you have to use a very very specific word to translate traktir, for instance, right? And uh, the first word that comes to your mind in in contemporary French and which French speakers associate with the 18th century is actually not what was a tra uh, traktir in the 18th century. So that was an interesting thing. Uh, another aspect of uh, my experience, uh, if I you know reflect on my experience. 
and I'm not sure we'll have time enough to uh, to uh, to discuss this, is that I started uh, translating the uh, Karensen's letters in 2020. I finished my translation and introduction in October 2021, but then it took a lot of time for various reasons to uh, produce the book, and the book came out after the beginning of the war in Ukraine, and uh, so I found myself in the situation uh, of a cultural enabler, pretty much like the people I'm discussing in the sense that, uh, you know, I was offering the French audience uh, a smiling face for Russia, you know, uh, the portrait of a xenophile, fully European, uh, peace-loving uh, Russian writer. So that was also something that I've, you know, been reflecting on uh, because of uh, the, uh, because of the, um, the calendar and the um, and and the war. Um, so uh, concerning what, what your question about political agendas, they mostly uh, are expressed uh, in the power texts of the text. That's that's the way I I figure. Um, I don't really think they come in the text themselves, uh, for the for the very simple reason that uh, Karamzin was very cautious. Uh, Karamzin was cautious to um, in in what he had to say about European politics, uh, and especially in what he had to say about the French Revolution. And uh, the, there's a whole you know very um, uh, detailed discussion in the uh, uh, bi bibliography dedicated to uh, letters of a Russian traveler about Karamzin's opinion on the French Revolution. And whether what he says, what he writes about it in, in his travelogue is actually what he thinks about it, or whether he uh, distorts his own opinion so as to avoid uh, problems of the censorship in Russia. And it's well known that uh, it took him several years uh, to uh, publish the, the French episode for political reasons. It was impossible to publish it under Catherine II and under Paul I. And the, the the main part of the French episode came out only uh, in 1801 um, in uh, under Alexander I. But still, I mean, he was cautious. He was, he was moderately conservative or moderately liberal, uh, you know, and it was very moderate. And um, um, what he has to say, for instance, he um, is very positive about Britain, um, with the exception that he criticizes the uh, democratic process. Uh, he makes fun of the election process because uh, he, he depicts the way British uh, members of parliament just you know invite voters to to uh, to the pub and and buy them drinks and uh, and secure their votes uh, this way so but i mean you know um uh, making fun uh since we're discussing the french translations making fun of the uh of the um of a century later of the uh, of some aspects of the british um political system uh, might not have appeared as uh, something political and uh, more likely as something uh, identity related, as a discourse on, as a French discourse on British identity. Um, so um, any political aspect to the critique? That's a very good question. I haven't thought about this. Uh, I don't know, to be honest. I think that the critique is, uh, First and foremost, literary. Uh, the, I mean, Le Grel is really upset. Le Grel translated the text in the 1880s in a very uh, sort of boring French language. Uh, it's very uh, characteristic of the age of positivism. Uh, it's 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 not poetic at all, and is obviously upset by the uh, the, the very poetic style used by Parochin. And uh, but is faithful to the text, uh, whereas Paroshan tries to uh, 
keep up with the uh, with the the 18th century style, but uh, gets rid of a lot of things uh, which he considers to be obsolete, like for instance the, the sentimentalist digressions, because uh, he, he considers that in the in the 1860s no one needs that that it's really sort of um, uh, almost a parody of what sentimentalism was. So um, he um, he uh, removes that from his translation. Um, so you had a question about the reason why there was a British and a German translation, but not a French one. Is that it? Not a full French one. I think it has to do with uh, what I discussed at, at the beginning of my talk, and uh, uh, that is cultural imperialism. Um, I think that, you know, um, I mean, France started being interested as you know, in, in German literature, it started being interested in, in English literature earlier, you know, thanks to Stern and to Shakespeare, obviously. And it started being interested in, in German literature, thanks to Germaine de Stahl, after she published a book called On Germany, de l'Allemagne, and uh, which played uh, a major role in uh, helping the French audience discover uh, Romanticism. Yeah, and uh, but uh, there were connections between um, between uh, Germany and Britain uh, that did not exist between Britain and France or um, Germany and France for the sole reason that uh, for a very long period France remained uh, you know uh, tied tied up by classicism but what what in English you 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 guys call neoclassicism what we call classicism, and especially under Napoleon. Uh, under Napoleon, you know, Racine was still the, the main dominating paradigm. And uh, romanticism was considered, romanticism was kind of, it, it actually was kind of um, uh, oppositional because Germain de Stahl was in the opposition and because uh, Chateaubriand was in the opposition. So uh, it was not considered to be to be, uh, it was not the, the the dominating trend. So I think that uh, Russian, German, and English literature talked to each other much more uh, at that time than Russian and French literature. Uh, and if you you know if you think about the 1760s, for instance, and that's what I I discussed uh, uh, earlier in my talk about the you know this. Uh, diplomatic use of literature, then uh, the, the amount of, you know, translations of Lamanosov and Sumarokov in France was probably, I'm not quite sure about this, but I suppose was higher in, in France than in Germany or in, in, especially in Britain, because they were so much closer to the, uh, to the dominating uh, French literary paradigm of um, neoclassicism. And this, uh, the, this, these connections between Russian, uh, German, and English literature, they're pretty obvious in uh, Masonic culture in Russia at the end of the 18th century. That's what, you know, the, the Freemasons are interested in. They're not interested in French literature anymore. They're interested in, in German and, and British literature. The fun part, and you, you may have noticed that, is that uh, Thieu de la Bouvry has no idea that the original, he knows that he's translating uh, from English translation, but he thinks that the original was written in German, which is yet another, you know, uh, sign of French cultural imperialism. And it's ironic since in the Karazin's letters of a Russian traveler, one French traveler, while discussing Russia and, uh, and Russian culture with Karamzin's traveler tells him, oh, you come from Russia. You guys speak German there, right? So, uh, you know, for your, for your uh, uh, Parisian John Doe in the 1790s, people in, 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 uh, in Russia spoke German. Can I, uh, can I stop you there? Sure. Uh, because we have, to, we have to, no, I'm I'm sorry to cut you off. I, we have to stop in a few minutes. So I just wanted to oh, see sorry. if there are any questions from the floor before, um, if not, you can continue. Uh, <laughs> does anyone, so does anyone from the audience have a question? You can write it in the chat. I think the chat's probably open or could be. 
um, or, or raise a hand or wave a hand? Well, I can probably keep on answering Abby's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please do. Um, great questions, Abby, and, and a lot of them again. Uh, so, uh, considering uh, concerning the reception, I, as I said, it, I mean, it's a very valid uh, question and remark. Uh, as I said, uh, it's not uh, a part of the uh, of the story that I have explored yet, but it, um, it's probably worth doing it. And um, and um, uh, you mentioned. Uh, as I did, political patronage, and uh, I, I, I was concerned with political patronage, uh, especially when dealing with um, with Paroshan. Uh, but then, and it's it's a question I actually asked um, earlier, uh, uh, Polina. Um, I I should look into the political options, the political opinions of the various uh, publishing houses. Uh, which are involved in this story. I mean, it, 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 it's uh, irrelevant uh, concerning Tour de la Bouvrie because that's, you know, it, that's self-publication on his own money. But, um, but the, um, the 1867 publication is, uh, I've forgotten, uh, but, but it came out in a, 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 with a prominent publishing house. And the, the one from 1885, uh, Millier, thank you, Paulina. Uh, thank you, Paulina. Uh, Millier, and the one from 1885, I think, is Achette. So it would be interesting to consider uh, the uh, the political agendas <coughs> of uh, of the of the two uh, at the at the precise time. On the other hand, I mean, you know, I'm pretty sure that Achette, like pretty much 99%. Of, of people in France in the 1880s was strongly anti-Prussian. And uh, so that's probably kind of a, that's a dominating trend again. There's a question in the chat. Evan, would you like to read your question or say it? Oh, no, thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to say thank you again so much for the presentation. Um, I guess since my question's been read, um, I won't repeat it, but thank you so much. Well, thank you for that wonderful question. Uh, it's a great question. I I don't know. I still have to study these translations. I have no idea where they are. Um, one of our colleagues got very excited when she heard that there was a translation of uh, Goria Tuma uh, into French, uh, which nobody knows. Uh, so I really need to look into this because um, I, I have no idea where they are. It would be interesting to see uh, uh, how he uh, translated, because he translated so many texts from so many different periods, uh, written in in very different uh, Russian languages. You know, from the, the the point of view of the evolution of the Russian literary language, and um, and um, you know, from the point of view of the aesthetic uh, uh, movements that they uh, that they belong to. So it would be interesting to see if he flattened uh, everything else just the way flat and terms and text. Um, so about the, uh, the, the specific status of the letters, um, I'm not sure, can you elaborate on that if we have uh, like a minute left? Cause I'm not quite sure that I understand the question. Sure, I guess I'm curious about whether the letters as, the fact that the letters represent a travelogue, if this impacted how they were translated, how the introductions to them were written and conceived, as opposed to um, as opposed to a novel, as opposed to a short story, um, especially given, I guess, a kind of, I don't want to say an imperative towards objectivity that travelogues have, but maybe in the minds of readership, there's this imperative, this documentarian uh, feature that they're supposed to have in the minds of probably right. vast majority of readership. Okay. Okay. Great. Yeah, I think I I, I see what you mean now. Um, well, the interesting thing is that, as uh, Abby put it, it's it's a hybrid genre. And uh, uh, which is partly document and partly diary, and uh, as as you know, uh, these are not real letters, right? I mean, it's a 
it's um, fictional correspondence, <coughs> but um, because the letters that Karamzin published were never written to specific people, but they heavily rely on uh, the notes that he took during his uh, during his journey through Europe. And the interesting thing is that um, I think that um, these three translators, uh, because they used that's you know that's my uh, hypothesis, because they used it with political agendas, they needed to um, um, emphasize the supposedly objective uh, dimension of the text. And uh, and they really sort of erased um, the other aspect of the text, which is connected with the uh, uh, you know the subjectivity, uh, which is which is at the, at the center of any kind of echo document, uh, including uh, private letters, even fake private letters, and and travel diaries. And that's the reason why. They they keep on uh, erasing the um, digressions because they think that the digressions um, uh, convey Karamzin's um, subjective impressions and emotions, and that's not a thing they're interested in. Uh, and the uh, so Paroshin sort of removes that, and it's probably following a certain logic. It leads to the you know, the, the the peak of that process of objectivizing this text is uh, is um, uh, Le Grel's paratextual presentation of the text as a document on the French Revolution, period. So Karamzin's subjectivity tends to disappear, you know, from uh, as, as, as the 19th century goes. I hope that answers even partly your question. Amply, thank you so much. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Rodolphe, and thank you, Abby. Thanks every, to everyone for coming. It's been great to hear about translation. We don't get to hear about that very much here. Um, Paulina talked about it a little bit when she was talking about um, Turgenev and uh, uh, Nasha Kakio, uh, Marko Vavchok. Um, but to have a whole talk focus on that and to bring the 18th century into the 19th century has been a lot of fun. So. Thank you for, for sharing that with us. And thanks we'll, for having me. Yeah. That was and, very uh, glad. Great. Great but, seminar. <laughs> and uh, I hope to see everybody on September 20th if you're if you're free <laughs> in your sure. respective time zones. <laughs> Thank you, Lovely. everyone. Thank you. Everyone. Have a good summer. Have a good, good summer, everyone. <laughs>